Okay, without further ado, I want to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Miriam Mora. And I'm really excited to welcome Professor Mora here tonight for, for at least two reasons. Um, first, her research and her work are, are absolutely fascinating. Professor Mora currently works as Director of Programs for the Center for Jewish History in New York City and is an Adjunct Assistant Professor at SUNY Albany. Um, Professor Mora is also the Managing Curator for the Museum and Laboratory of the Jewish Comics Experience at the Center for Jewish History and is co-creator of the JUICE Comics Convention. Her, her research, J-E-W-C-E, -E, uh, her, her, uh, her research extends beyond comic books. Indeed, her first book, Carrying a Big Shtick, Jewish Acculturation and Masculinity in the 20th Century, will be released from Wayne State University Press in 2024. And the second reason I'm really excited to have Professor Mora speak to us tonight is that it's a homecoming of sorts. She grew up in Ann Arbor, and before earning her PhD at Wayne State University in 2019, Professor Mora was the, well, then not Professor, um, <laughs> Mora was the engagement director at Hillel at EMU for two years, and also in Ann Arbor worked as the assistant director of education at Beth Israel Congregation for a year. So, Please join me in welcoming Professor Mora to the podium. Hey, everybody. Can you hear me OK? Great. Thank you so much uh, to Bob for that really generous introduction. When you lay out everything you've been doing in that fashion, it sounds uh, I was like, wow, this is an impressive, uh, this is an impressive person. <laughs> So, uh, so thank you for that. And thank all of you for coming out tonight um, through this inclement weather, and which is, I guess is going to be worse when we leave. So I'll try and be you know, super fast. No. <laughs> um, it is, it is, it's a, a real privilege to be back at EMU, um, where I was a student 20 years ago <laughs> and, uh, and worked, as, as Bob said, as Hillel Engagement Director, um, just at the time when the Jewish Studies Department was being founded um, by Marty Schickman. I think I actually, as you know, as as a Hillel employee, drove the first few speakers to and from the airport. So I mean, I, I'm really honored to be uh, to be here as as one of them now. Especially hearing that amazing lineup of events, it's just amazing to hear how far this um, this program has really come. It's uh, it's awesome. So. Um, as Dr. Erlewine said, I'm a, I'm a historian. I'm an immigration and ethnic historian focusing on Jewish America. So my, my book that's coming out is on Jewish masculine identity. It is not about comics. This is a totally different project, although if anyone has any questions about masculinity and comics, boy, would I love to talk with you about that too. Um, but tonight, I'm going to give you a, a sort of crash course on the Jewish comics industry. Uh, as, as he said, I, I curated this exhibit on Jews and comics, which is currently on display in New York. It's actually been extended a few times, but is, I believe, really finally going to close next month, um, which is a bit of a shame. I'll show you a, a few pictures, very, very few from the exhibit, but um, you can also visit it uh, online. We're going to be doing a whole digitized version, hopefully, and the exhibit's going to travel. Uh, so hopefully it'll make its way somewhere in Michigan and, and you know, I'll send all of you alerts. So, <laughs> so by, when I say a crash course on Jewish comics history, what I really mean by that is I'm going to talk to you about really three things. One is I'm going to talk about the Jewish origins of the industry and just how many of the guys and gals were Jewish and what that tells us about the industry and reciproca reciprocally what it tells us about Jewish life in America at the time, at the turn of the 20th century. Then I'm going to talk about the ways that Jewish comics creators wrote Jewish identity and culture into their comics from the beginning of the industry to the present. And lastly, I'm going to look at the contemporary moment that we're in now and talk about Jewish identity in comics and how it's changing, what that looks like, and what I hope it's going to look like in the future. Um, not that that's really, that's more just conjecture and, and excitement, um, and what that says about this moment in the experience of being Jewish in comics and being a Jewish comics writer and reader. 
So that's a whole lot of ground to cover from the 1915 time period to the future, but we'll do the best that we can and, and hopefully have some time to chat at the end. So just as a, as a bit of a warning, I'm not going to be listing every single Jewish character that I like and have read. <laughs> so please don't be offended if I don't mention your favorite. Uh, we can always chat about them at the end. It is literally my favorite thing to talk about. So, uh, so I'm here for that. <coughs> Excuse me. So the comics industry, um, on the whole, was founded by uh, Jewish immigrants and the children of Jewish immigrants. And there's a number of reasons for this. One is that the industry really grew out of other forms of publishing, and New York City was the home of much of the contemporary publishing industry, as well as the country's largest Jew Jewish population. So we're talking about nearly e exactly a century ago, at the end of the mass migration period. Between 1820 and 1924, over that hundred year span, there's this increasingly steady flow of Jews coming to America, culminating in huge sums of immigrants at the turn of the century. So they're driven primarily out of, out of Europe by economic hardship, persecution, massive social and political upheavals of the 19th century. So we're talking about industrialization, overpopulation, urbanization, and millions of European Jews left their homelands and came to the US. So to give you an idea of just how tremendous this increase in the Jewish population is, during this period, there's almost a hundredfold increase in the Jewish population in the United States. Mm -hmm. Between 1820 and 1880, before the turn of the 20th century, uh, there's an increase from 3,000 Jews in the United States to 300,000. Then, from 1880 to 1920, over that next 40-year period, there's another tenfold increase to roughly 3,500,000. So this is a really rapid population change. So of course, New York being the primary landing site for Europe's Jews is full of Jewish immigrants and their children at the turn of the century, and the earliest ones' grand grandchildren as well. And these people are fighting for a future, for a better life, and looking to make their mark and survive, just like all other immigrants in the city. And anti-Semitism kept a lot of young Jewish men from getting jobs in the early 20th century um, in a lot of industries but particularly in industries about kind of putting more materials into the world like publication, um, in Hollywood and certain forms of politics, uh, even careers in the military and lots of other venues, which again, I can talk about masculinity excessively here, but it's, uh, it's not as good of a, a fit for this. So um, as for the invention of comics, of course, people have been telling stories with pictures since prehistoric times. But what we would recognize as comic books have really only existed since the early 20th century. So it really began with newspaper comic strips appearing in the late 19th and early 20th century. Uh, the first one being generally agreed upon, first one being Richard Occult's The Yellow Kid, which you see at the top, and this is one of the most famous. The strip showed life in the immigrant uh, Irish slums of downtown Manhattan. So this one was not a Jewish comic, um, but it kind of laid the groundwork. And there were some strips in these really early days that were Jewish, that were written by Jews and had Jewish themes, Jewish characters. Uh, one of those was what you see in the middle, which is uh, Harry Hirschfield's A.B. the Agent. Has anyone heard of this one? No, it's not popular anymore, obviously. It was a, it was a humor strip about an immigrant Jewish car salesman named Abraham Kabibble. And as you can imagine, it doesn't really age very well. You know, a lot of the humor is a little racist and a lot racist. Um, and the uh, stereotyping of Jews is not great either. But I, if you're interested in that, a new book is actually about to come out on A.B. the Agent from Rutgers University Press. So I'm pretty excited about that. Where the Jewish content is really, uh, really coming out is in the Yiddish papers at the time. And that's what you see on the bottom is a, uh, a Yiddish comic. And so these, <coughs> these Yiddish papers which were published in abundance in Manhattan uh, in the early 20th century, they adopted various aspects of American print culture to assist in the guided acculturation and adjustment of Yiddish-speaking Jewish-American immigrants. So comics were one of these things that they were kind of putting out there, just along with being a daily newspaper, which wasn't common um, in Europe either. So it's one of these things, and it included um, you know, more silly humor, some political commentary, um, and particularly Jewish-themed gags and gaffes and stuff like that. So though these had 
already been popular for decades by the time we're really going to focus on, which is like the origin of the superhero construct and the beginning of the golden age of comics. Um, so they've been popular for a while. Actually, A.B. the Agent at one point in 1917, he was written joining the army, right, to fight for America. So they kind of, yeah, so we know it's been around for a while. I'm not sure exactly what year it started. Um, but one thing, I'm going to, I pulled up these two for a reason. Uh, I know it's probably too far away for a lot of you to read, and some of you don't read Yiddish, but the first one is A.B. has bought a restaurant. And uh, I picked the two of them because they're both restaurant themed, which I think is interesting because it says something about Jewish restaur restaurateurs in New York. But he's, uh, he's adopted this policy in his restaurant of yelling out people's orders because it makes other people order more. But then he says at the end, like, oh, I'm not going to yell out that order because I'm not going to yell out anything that's under 25 cents. <laughs> so like a bit of a negative stereotype. We've got the same thing happening in Yiddish papers, but I'd argue a bit more sophisticated. Um, so this one, this Yiddish comic, which remember, it's Yiddish, so it reads from right to left, not from left to right. Um, but we've got this this man who's in this restaurant and he orders it says vegetarian restaurant and He's ordered a vegetarian fish and he says oh this fish is so good um, You know, it's just amazing that it's vegetarian. You know what? I'll go ahead and try the chicken too And then you see in the kitchen and there's a woman slaughtering these um, Chickens, so it's 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 all kind of about the uh, the, the poor Business practices of, of this community, so it's not it doesn't hold up very well in that way um, but moving on getting into actual you know what we think of as comic books uh, in 1929, we see the stock market crash and ushering in the Great Depression, which creates a need for cheap, disposable, consumable entertainment. And it also creates economic conditions where young Jewish creators are able to use whatever skills they have uh, in these budding industries to support their families and help try and bring them out of these kind of dire circumstances. Um, here we go. There are a lot of people, primarily men, a product of the time and you know the workforce who were responsible for the comics industry. I want to hire. I want to highlight a few of the most influential, all Jews. Um, some of them immigrants themselves, some children of immigrants, several refugees. So if you're asking why this matters to yourself, why does it matter that these founders of the industry are Jewish? Really, in the history of the medium, I would remind you of the state of the world for Jews at the time. Uh, and how deeply influenced this first wave of popular comics. The entire superhero genre, really, it, is filled with outsider heroes fighting for justice and championing the oppressed. So it's very much a product of these people at this time. And among the first public, that's not to say that they weren't also opportunists, right, trying to make a living, which they certainly were. And among the first publications that we'd recognize as comic books, were compilations of early newspaper strips, things like what we saw in the last, the last slide, um, assembled by a newspaper, newsprint salesman named Maxwell Ginsburg, who would become known as Max Gaines. You'll notice almost every name that I put on slides has been changed. That's part of the immigrant process, part of acculturation, part of forced assimilation. You know, and forced, I mean self-enforced assimilation. They want to sell their goods. You know, they want to succeed in business. So Gaines invents the saddle-stitched saddle pamphlet, which became the standard comic book form um, for the American comics industry. He founded All American Comics, which is responsible for heroes like um, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, Hawkman. Later, he founded Educational Comics, EC Comics, which we'll come back to later on because it's a really important one. And during this period, Pulp magazines were already very popular. They were called pulps because they were made of this incredibly cheap paper and you could see the wood pulp, you know, in the sheets. And these were the precursor to comics um, featuring stories with particularly genre fiction, uh, like westerns, detective stories, and science fiction, which is one of the reasons I put up um, this Luxembourg-born Jewish immigrant, Hugo Gernsbeck, who coined the term ciento fiction, science fiction, in his pulps, uh, like Amazing Stories, which I think the first issue of which debuted Duck Buck Rogers on the front. And uh, he had lots of these sci-fi pulps, Amazing Stories, Modern Science, and I think about 20 others. And he followed up with, with dozens and dozens of these magazines and stories, and is still regarded as the father of sci-fi, which is why the Hugo Awards, the sci-fi awards, are named for him. There was a pulp writer named Malcolm Wheeler Nicholson, not Jewish, um, which isn't why he's not pictured, he wasn't as important, but he's still important, um, <laughs> who founded National Allied Publications in 1934 and published the first comic book to feature entirely 
uh, new material rather than compiled comic strips from other places. And he joined forces with these two pictured together uh, on the bottom left, Jack Leibowitz and Harry Donenfeld, who was uh, previously a pornography publisher. And as national, opportunistic industry, right? And as national, they created and distributed detective and action comics, which some of you have probably heard of if you're at all into comics. Um, those are the precursors to DC comics. Okay. So they'd all roll into what would become DC. So the first action comics, as we'll see, is Superman, right? He was debuted in Action One. And though this would become one of the biggest two uh, in the industry. The other, and uh, started by another pulp uh, publisher, Moses Martin Goodman, who was born in Brooklyn, son of Jewish immigrants. He saw the success that National was having with their two biggest earliest hits, which were Superman and Batman. And, uh, and this led him to enter the comic book business and start right in with superheroes. So he called his comics Timely Comics. And his 1939 debut, the first comic was called Marvel Comic. Mm -hmm. So you can see what they would be renamed later. <laughs> and that first issue uh, featured the debut of Submariner, which they're still writing Submariner, and the Human Torch. Still writing Human Torch, right? So really lasting characters. And these would be the mainstays of Goodman's company, even when it became known in later years as Marvel Comics. So I want to begin back at Action Comics with the start of the superhero genre. And that really means going back to these guys. Siegel and Schuster. So Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, two Jewish kids from a particularly Jewish neighborhood in Cleveland, children of immigrants, created what you see here. These are sci-fi fan magazines. They read amazing stories. They watched Metropolis. They were super into sci-fi. I thought this was the coolest ever. They met when they were 10 years old. They created these fanfic magazines. And I say fanfic, which is a contemporary term, but that is absolutely what they are, uh, in high school together. So this is actually a picture from the exhibit I have up. Um, so that's a case we have up in, uh, in my museum in New York right now in this, this Jewish comics uh, exhibit. Those are all five issues of this fanfic magazine they put together called Science Fiction, The Advanced Guard of Future Civilization. The third issue is open in the center, and it's open to a page of, this, of the story where they first mentioned Superman. It's called The Reign of Superman. So they had uh, written these themselves, typed them up on a typewriter, brought them into school, and according to legend, bribed the school secretary to let them use the mimeograph machine to photocopy them. <laughs> incredibly few copies of this exist because they're so cheaply made, they're stapled together, they fall apart. Um, so it was, it was amazing that we managed to get our hands on some of them. The Library of Congress has scans of them, so they're not you know, going to be gone forever. But uh, you can see in the first story, I don't know how, how well you can see it at this size, but in the upper left is the first issue, and you can see there's no illustrations, right? It's, it looks like the cover of a school essay. Um, but as they kind of progressed throughout the year, they really started putting in illustrations, and, and in, in the fourth issue, there's um, photos of them and biographies, and they were both using pseudonyms, and I mean, it's really, uh, it's really great stuff. So in this third issue, which was 1933, the boys were, I think, I think 14, um, they created this story, The Reign of Superman, about a uh, bald, telepathic villain who was intent on world domination. So it's not the Superman that you know. <laughs> Um, but it is kind of like Lex Luthor, except for the whole telepathy thing. Um, <clears throat> in that third issue, uh, the Superman is nothing like he was going to be in future years, like what we would see, but it's really heavily influenced by Gernsback and sci-fi and the sci-fi magazines he put out. So Schuster, originally, by the way, Schusterowitz, so again, a name change. Um, he himself wasn't very Jewish religiously, but, uh, but Siegel was. And the whole creation that they did together was very influenced by Jewish history, Jewish experience, um, and, uh, and Jewish storytelling. <coughs> and both of their parents had left Europe, Lithuania and current day Ukraine, respectively, to escape persecution. So that's where a lot of the story kind of comes from. And Superman debuted, as we know him, in Action Comics number one in 1938, published by National, later DC. And the character was an immediate hit and established the hero as a mainstay of pop culture, right? which he still is. In 1996, uh, this is one of my favorite quotes about Superman and Jewishness. I'm just going to read from Jules Pfeiffer, who's uh, himself an amazing cartoonist. 
And he said, quote, it wasn't Krypton that Superman came from. It was the planet Minsk or Luj or Vilna or Warsaw, unquote. Not hell. So he, not hell. <laughs> so he saw Superman as this very thinly disguised Jewish immigrant. And in Superman number one in 1939, so the first comic that gave him his backstory, uh, it tells us this refugee story, right? This is a reflection largely of this moment in history where they're writing it. <clears throat> but it also, the actual backstory is very comparable to a lot of traditional Jewish stories, right? Um, putting a baby, saving a baby from certain death by putting him in a little basket and sending him away in the traditional garb of his people to be picked up and taken in by outsiders and to carry his, uh, the lessons of his people with him and make the world a better place. It's a very Jewish story, right? That's the story of Moses in so many ways. Um, and actually it is in the comics that that suit, the superhero suit with the S, the Superman outfit, is supposed to be the garb of Krypton. That's supposed to be his garb from home. So he keeps it close to him, even when he's disguising himself as Clark Kent, when he's, you know, assimilating and playing this role of this, you know, um, immigrant. <clears throat> Other ways that the story is particularly Jewish, I mean, there's, there's entire books about this, which I'll recommend, so you know you can you can really dig to the depth of that you want to on the subject. But his name, his Kryptonian name, Kal El in Hebrew means voice of God. Jor El, his father's name, actually is just a uh, an anagram for Jerome Siegel, Joe Siegel, who wrote it. So <laughs> that one's not as that one's not as fun as you'd think. Um, but you know he's also comparatively similar to um, Samson. Right, who was described as being able to leap these tremendous heights and who was a judge and who fought for justice. So there's a lot of kind of biblical stories in here. And then there's also a lot of golem comparisons, right? Protecting his people, protecting everybody, um, calling upon someone to bring truth and justice into the world. It's a, it's a very Jewish story in a lot of ways. But it's also kind of an all immigrant story in a lot of ways. And that's this moment that we're talking about where Siegel and Schuster created Superman, it's a moment where universalism was so important. Making these stories accessible to everyone was incredibly important. And less so was it important to them to highlight that, that he was Jewish, right? These were important progressive <coughs> ideals they wanted to put out. So I want to bring your attention to a, a few more images here um, because this is one of my favorite interactions. Uh, Siegel and Schuster <clears throat> drew on a lot of inspirations, right? A lot of Jewish stuff, a lot of contemporary sci-fi, but really kind of the biggest, uh, the, the momentum behind their creating the character was the rise of Nazism, right? And the rise of Hitler, which is why they looked at that original Superman illustration, the evil Superman, and they said, you know what? We don't need any more villains in the world, right? We need someone good. So they changed their Superman and they made him someone who could arguably defeat Hitler. And uh, they wanted him to fight Hitler directly, as, opposed, as he was supposed to represent you know, the best and the most worthwhile heroic qualities of humanity. And <clears throat> almost two years before the US entered the war, when most Americans still opposed intervention, Superman declared war on Hitler and Stalin. And he did so not through the comic publisher, but in Look Magazine, in this, uh, this image right up here. Wow. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, I, I blew up one of the frames so you could see one of, one of the greatest quotes, I think, where he says, he says, I'd like to land a strictly non-Aryan sock on your jaw, <laughs> which is really kind of as close as Superman gets to saying he's not a white dude, right? Which he's obviously not because he's not from the planet Earth, but, um, but such was their kind of mission. Um, <clears throat> this comic bothered the Nazis so much that they responded with a full page editorial in the official newspaper of the SS, which is what you see right here. Um, and it explained, and I'll quote translation, quote, Superman's sense of justice, well suited for imitation by the American youth, uh, quote, was, it says, was a, he, they said it was a, conspir a Jewish conspiracy to quote, to so quote, hate suspicion evil laziness and criminality in their young hearts, unquote. This is how they describe Superman. And supposedly this was written by Joseph Goebbels, the Minister of Propaganda. There's no confirmation of that, uh, but it was in the official SS paper. 
And meanwhile, the creators, Siegel and Schuster, are getting hate mail and threats and all kinds of things for their, you know, attack on Hitler and Look Magazine because they were supposed to be staying out of it, right? American press was staying out of it, American publishers were staying out of it, Hollywood was staying out of it. So in uh, Superman number 25, which came out after the SS article, they responded to it by spoofing it. And that's what you see uh, in these two images right here. Um, they spoofed the article by making Superman is reading a comic in the comic, so this is very meta, um, where there's a superhero named Geezer, and Geezer has made Hitler the laughing stock of the world. And infuriated in the comic, the Nazi agents try to kill the creators of Geezer, but then they're thwarted by Superman dressed as Geezer. <laughs> so it's all, it's, it's, it's highly meta, but it was really, uh, it's really terrific. So Superman, you know, they do this through humor and they do it through, you know, this kind of light, lightness to feeding darkness. Um, he's the epitome of good and hope. But what's going on in Europe and what's going on with, uh, you know, to the Jews of Europe sparked really different responses in different areas of this industry as well. Um, so I also want to look at some of that. So in 1939, uh, D what would become DC Comics publishes another, uh, another very, very popular hero written by two Jewish kids from the Bronx, Bob Kane and Bill Finger, and they contrast uh, it really contrasts this very light world of Superman, which saw hope in defeating evil and contained so many happy endings and so much justice. Cain and Finger's book really reflected the idea that the world had gone dark, right? That everything had darkened um, in November, excuse me, in November of 1938 with the destruction of Jewish businesses and homes and houses of worship in Germany in uh, what would become known as Kristallnacht, the night of broken glass. <clears throat> And they saw this as kind of the, the potential end of, of Jewish Europe, and they wanted to show that darkness in the comic. So in Batman, uh, it, it, everything is kind of living in this shadow-filled, brutal night that, that is what the world had become for the authors after, uh, after Kristallnacht. So unlike the shining metropolis we see in Superman, Inspired by the like bright sci-fi of the time, Kane and Finger created Gotham City, which is dark and it's just in the comic. If any of you have read the other, it's really always seems to be night, right? Mm -hmm. And Batman, unlike Clark Kent, uh, is not a mild mannered reporter, but a detective. He's a, very influenced by the shadow and the kind of detective stories of the time, and everything is just just a level darker. His parents are murdered in front of him, so he goes through the same process of his world darkening. Um, as the larger world seemed to uh, for the authors. And according to Jerry Robinson, who was the Jewish creator of the Joker, Batman, he saw Batman as an immigrant fantasy figure, right? So he's not an immigrant, he's not a Jewish character, uh, but he is self-made and he strikes back at all of these people who have hurt him and abused others and less fortunate people in the city. But he was never coded as Jewish in the ways that Superman was. But ironically, this year, <laughs> technically last year, because it's 2024, Batman became Jewish. Um, he was retconned Jewish, I believe, accidentally. Do you know the term retcon? It's short for retroactive continuity. So when you take established canon and you change it, and you say, okay, well, now Batman's always been, you know, left-handed or whatever, right? But because his cousin, um, Catherine Kane, Batwoman, She's been identified as Jewish for some time, but one of the authors, I believe a non-Jewish author, explained her lineage casually. And it turns out that if you trace it halakhically by how her mother, <laughs> now Batman's Jewish too. So that's pretty great. How fun is that? <laughs> <clears throat> so in the meantime, while these comics are, uh, are coming out, we've got Martin Goodman, who I mentioned at Timely Comics, he hires two young American-born Jews, children of immigrants, to produce comics in-house, along with the many freelancers that he was working with. Those were Jaime Joe Simon and Jack Kirby, born Kurtzberg, who were uh, from Manhattan's Lower East Side. And Simon was the editor and Kirby was the art director, but they both wore a lot of hats. They were both great writers, they were both great artists, so they kind of had their hands in everything. And together they created and debuted Captain America. And uh, they created him in 1939, he debuted in 1940. 
Uh, Joe Simon said about his creation, quote, we knew what was going on over in Europe. World events gave us the perfect comic book villain, Adolf Hitler, with his ranting, goose-stepping, and ridiculous mustache. So we decided to create the perfect hero who would be his foil, unquote. So although Superman attacked Hitler one time, you know, in Look Magazine, this was the whole intention of Captain America, right? Punching Nazis was his game. <laughs> So this was a full year before Pearl Harbor, when 93% of Americans still opposed entering the war. And the German-American Bund uh, inundated Simon and Kirby and the timely offices with hate mail and calls. Um, they threatened to hang them from lampposts in Times Square. Um, it took the intervention of the mayor, uh, LaGuardia, the, before uh, he, he intervened and ended up posting um, police officers in the lobby of Timely Comics every day. Um, so it really says something about how it felt to be a young Jew in the city at the time speaking out about this kind of thing and about what was happening in Europe. <clears throat> and they really were speaking out. Um, I mean, I, you, you probably see in the very first, I put, this is from the cover of the very first Captain America, you know, the debut, he's punching Hitler in the face. I know at least 10 people, including myself, who have this printed as a poster on their wall, you know, very classic. Um, but this is actually my favorite cover. And this is a cover from 1945. And the reason I love this cover is that at the time, even at the end of the war, American presses were really downplaying what was going on in Europe. Has anyone been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC? I think one of the most amazing parts of their permanent exhibit is the, the, when it examines the press and you look at how many mentions were there of the persecution of Jews in Europe. And it's shameful, right? I mean, the American press was very intentionally kind of glossing over and ignoring and trying to keep things positive on the front of the page. And, um, and here we have Captain America directly confronting what's going on in Germany and not just by punching Hitler in the face. So this cover is my favorite because it shows how much was really common knowledge about the Holocaust by the end of the war. You can see um, in this image inmates being marched at gunpoint into, um, into ovens. You can see human remains coming out of the other side with you know, human parts sticking out of the ashes. It's very dark. It's very visceral. Um, and it shows just how much was really known. So this character of Captain America and his antics because of the uh, minor role of the industry at the time, right? This is really just when it's getting big. They flew largely under the radar. I mean, of course, the, Amer the German-American Bund was pretty unhappy, but, but they kept putting this stuff out. <coughs> so they were permitted in some ways to engage in the kind of commentary that Hollywood had officially banned um, in the lead up and throughout the war. And in spite of all of the hate mail and you know, breaking the silence in entertainment about what was going on in Europe, Captain America was still one of the best-selling comics or magazines of its era, which I think is pretty, uh, pretty incredible. Now, after World War II ends, it ends with atomic explosions in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And in terms of the comics, the reverberations of those explosions continued for decades, because we see this whole roster of superheroes created by radiation, right? So the, still just pushing that the war and everything that's going on so dictates what's going on in these books. But before that, the end of the war also started to the decline in the popularity of the superhero. While Superman and Batman and Wonder Woman continued to appear in print, um, the public really wanted to see something different in their comics. So new comic genres emerge. One of the most popular was romance comics, which was pioneered by uh, Simon and Kirby, who had now moved on from Timely. Horror and crime, co crime comics became really popular. Uh, but by the time, before they left, Simon and Kirby had hired their boss's cousin by marriage, a 17-year-old named Stanley Martin Leeper, uh, to be their assistant, and he stayed on. He was the oldest son of Romanian Jewish immigrants, and he would soon change his name to Stanley. So that's how he came in before, uh, before Simon and Kirby left. So horror and crime comics really had this heyday with EC Comics, um, which I mentioned earlier, which was Max Gaines's company. And it had passed to Max Gaines's son uh, when Bill, or sorry, passed to uh, Max Gaines's son, Bill Gaines, when Max died uh, in a boating accident, I think. And he had a different vision for the company. 
Bill did. Um, he wanted to save it from bankruptcy because at this point things were kind of declining in the industry. He kept the initials EC, but he changed the name from educational comics to entertaining comics. And with his uh, then editor, Al Feldstein, uh, with whom he wrote, co-wrote a lot of stories, he focused the company on producing a variety of different genres, especially crime, horror, and science fiction. And these stories often had a lot of you know, embedded morals and ethics and, and kind of lessons in them. And they were really, really popular. They got a lot of attention from fans, but they also got a lot of attention from censors when censorship really started cracking down during the Red Scare. So for a time, most comics were governed by this self-censoring comics code, which you might have heard of or recognized the stamp that's often in uh, the corner of old comics. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> the comics code was modeled on a similar co code that bound the, uh, the film industry during the war. And it was in this context, when all they were specifically targeting these horror comics and things, uh, because they had um, really graphic violence and some of them had kind of lewd themes, arguably, I mean, not by today's standard even remotely, but you know. Um, because of this, DC Comics editor Julius Schwartz, and I'm throwing out some random names just to, just to, to show you they're all still Jewish right, at this point. Um, Julius Schwartz decided to see if there was a market for updated versions of the superheroes, which had gone out of style a few years before. <clears throat> so he relaunched um, The Flash, which had been so popular in the 40s, uh, he relaunched it in 1956, in, and this kicks off the start of what would become known as the Silver Age of comics. So the popularity of this revival of The Flash led to revamps in lots of other superheroes, including Green Lantern and The Atom, and eventually a lot of DC's heroes would team up as the Justice League, uh, which became a huge hit. And the Justice League inspired more team comics like the Challengers of the Unknown, which was led by the company that would become Marvel, um, the Fantastic Four, right, which was, which, was, uh, which was also launched through Marvel and became, it was a very New York comic. And that's how it was kind of described. It's a very New York comic, which is in a lot of ways code for being a very Jewish comic. Um, it was Jewish in tone in that there was a lot of kind of ironic humor, um, very Borscht Belt kind of style humor. And a lot of that was from Stan Lee. <laughs> Excuse me. And there was a lot of concern in the plots of Fantastic Four, specifically with these kind of tangentially theological topics, like um, the, the appearance of sta uh, the stand in God Galacticus, right? It's, it's like these very godlike figures. And decades later, some of the characters, particularly Ben Grimm, the thing, would be revealed to have been Jewish the whole time. Um, but we're going to talk about that's a, that's a retcon, and we're going to talk about that a bit more in the next slide. Um, but Fantastic Four's success led Marvel to increase the line of superheroes even more, and we see more superheroes created by with even more Jewish themes, like Spider-Man, who was created by Stanley and Steve Git Ditko uh, for 1962's Amazing Fantasy, and this was the most successful. And this I'm referring to kind of, I refer to this as like the Stan Lee generation um, because we see a change in the way that Jewishness is depicted and defined and interpreted. So we're going to talk just for a minute about Peter Parker, who's this ostracized, brainy teenager living with his impoverished aunt in Forest Hills, Queens. And he was read at the time and still by a lot of people as being pretty heavily coded as Jewish. If you're Jewish and reading this comic, you knew it was Jewish because you know what Fischlagener means, you know. Um, so he, he has this very famous origin story where he allows a burglar to escape a, a crime scene leading to his uh, beloved Uncle Ben's murder. And he takes the lesson from that with great power uh, comes great responsibility, which is arguably also a variant on the biblical lesson about being your brother's keeper. Uh, he uses, as I said, he uses Yiddish, like he uses in the first few issues, I think he uses kibitzer, schlep, and fetch. Um, so again, very borscht belty. Um, and perhaps what's most Jewish about Spider-Man, which was true of a lot of the heroes created by Jews of his time, was that his origins lay in traumatic loss. Right? We see that a lot in this period. So we've got Peter Parker's loss of his father figure, Batman's loss of his parents, Superman's loss of his entire planet and culture, the X-Men, another Stanley and Kirby creation were all neglected, persecuted, traumatized by their exclusion from larger society. 
So arguably a lot of, of um, I don't want to say just Jewish themes because so many people you know, have these experiences, uh, but they're coming out of a lot of Jewish sources. And these profound losses can also, I think, be related, especially in the case of Superman, to loss of the old country, right? To loss of the way of life um, and traumatized by exclusion from larger society. So in this light, you could argue, and I'm not actually making this argument, that all superheroes are Jewish. Right? <laughs> <clears throat> but what's really new in this time is the degree to which Jewish creators were writing Jewishness into their characters for those in the know, right? They weren't coming out and saying these are Jewish characters, but you know, any Jewish kid reading Spider-Man knew that kibitz was a Jewish word. So, you know, but others didn't, it's just oh, some gibberish, you know? And that's how, that's how kids do tend to read, um, which is a miracle of being a child, right? Is you just <laughs> fill in blanks and you move forward. Uh, so Jewish fans did know, and this coding of Jewish characters really create, uh, continued for decades. And it was done by non-Jewish creators as well, especially as they picked up the titles of pre-existing characters and wanted to keep their identities. You know, so we have a lot of non-Jewish writers come into the industry and write for characters trying to you know, maintain that kind of Jewish sound. Um, so I want to... I want to go beyond this, uh, but beyond the superhero and coding of Jewish characters, uh, which is in many ways, I think, where this actually starts to get interesting. So a half hour in. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. So, oh, for, the, for, for further reading, uh, these, are, these are all books that cover the Golden and Silver Age of Jewish comics. Uh, <laughs> so um, I've worked with all of these authors, they're all amazing. Um, but I can tell you, is Superman Circumcised is the newest one that came out last year. And it is phenomenal. It is a deep, deep dive just into Superman. And if you like Superman, you know, even a quarter as much as I do, and he's not my favorite superhero, it's fantastic. So I strongly recommend it. Um, but they're all great. <laughs> so, um, superhero comics, movies, shows, even merchandise around them have continued to contend with this issue of uh, ethnic and religious identity, right? Because it's character development. And they do so so much more openly now than they did in the previous generation. So I want to talk about two key issues here with Jewish representation in the superhero genre. And, uh, and, and after that, I will, I will leave you to enjoy this lovely spread of food. So... <laughs> First, I want to talk about Ashka normativity, and then we're going to talk about trauma as identity. So on this slide, you'll see a few recognizable characters. Moon Knight from left to right. We've got Moon Knight, Harley Quinn, Kitty Pride, and Ragman. Um, and below, at the bottom, you'll see a foot hovering over a glass. That's when uh, Peter Parker officially became Jewish in a flashback in Into the Spider-Verse. <laughs> well, I said, oh yeah, and then I married Mary Jane. Step on the glass. <laughs> what? Now he's Jewish? But it's an alternate reality, so, eh, you know. <laughs> but we'll take it. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so these are all characters uh, who have been, who are officially Jewish. And these are all pages where they're discussing their Jewishness in some way, right? And, <clears throat> excuse me, recently, I've run across a lot of criticism um, about this trope of characters being outed as Jewish and then not really having Jewish stories. And, you know, the argument is that characters like Kitty Pride are Jewish, and I quote this, in name only, right? She wears a Star of David, but what is her Jewish story, right? How do we get to see more about her being Jewish? And I take issue with that particular argument for a number of reasons, but the most significant gets to the core of the problem of Jewish representation, I think, which is how do you make a character particularly Jewish, right? Should she be excusing herself from missions on Shabbos? <laughs> Should she be covering her head after her wedding to Colossus? You know, they didn't actually get married. Spoiler, they didn't actually get married. <laughs> or conversely, is the issue that she looks insufficiently ethnically Jewish. Should she be drawn with a more dramatic nose? Should her hair be curly? Should she uh, have darker skin? I mean, I think it's obvious what the answer to these questions are, right? Which is, if you get really heavy-handed, then you're making a caricature. You're not really creating a character. So, though I've heard this complaint a lot, that characters aren't Jewish enough, if you, you know, if you think it's not just about Jewish characters, but, but about any, like, oh, you know, they... They said that they've revamped this character as being, you know, Latin, but they're so light-skinned and who knows, you know, it's, 
uh, what's the way to make that better? Because that's a really difficult argument to make. So the issue I take with this is not only that it's impossible to do in a really heavy-handed way and well at the same time, but <clears throat> the problem is that the it highlights the real problem, which is that they're all passing because, they I mean, they can all be white passing because they're all Ashkenazi. So I said Ashkenormativity as a problem, right? And this is a real problem. The world of Jews is not a white world. The world of Jews is diverse. There are Asian Jews, there are black Jews, there are Mizrahi Jews, there are Sephardi Jews, and there is a you know largest amount still of Ashkenazi Jews. But when characters are Jewish in comic books, they are Ashkenazi. And a lot of that is because they're retcon Jewish later. Magneto was not written as Jewish initially. He was actually Roma Sinti, and then he was retconned as Jewish later, which is easy to do if the characters you're retconning are white. And you're going to make all your Jewish characters Ashkenazi. So it's something to think about, right? Just along that line, as they're all Ashkenazi, they're also all uh, acculturated Americans. And they're also all uh, secular. As I said, Kitty Pride has never excused herself from an X-Men mission for Shabbos, <laughs> like not once. Um, but it's not a complaint either, because a lot of Jews are Ashkenazi and secular, right? So the question is, where are all the other Jews, right? That's the real question that I think people should be asking themselves. Um, so diversity could manifest, Jewish diversity, and really representative Jewish diversity could represent, manifest in a number of ways. You could have, instead of throwing out Yiddish terms, they could throw out Ladino terms. I mean, PJ Library publishes books in Ladino now. Um, so it's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's something that could be done. Judeo-Arabic languages could be spoken. Hebrew could be spoken. Um, they could have different forms of practice. Instead of just kind of being American Reformed Jews, they could be Orthodox, they could be Haredi, they could be Sephardi, uh, they could have any other form of modern practice. And location. They could not be from New York City. <laughs> they could not be from Western Europe, right? They could be from somewhere else. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So the way that these characters are generally introduced as Jewish is, I would argue, the core of the problem in the more traditional superhero genre, which is whether they're retconning them or not, they're identifying them as Jewish through trauma. And when you identify as Jewish through trauma, you're doing a number of things. One is you're almost inevitably invoking the Holocaust. The Jewish people are, shocker, not defined by the Holocaust, right? But it's not just the Holocaust. It's the idea that to identify a character as Jewish, you have to make them suffer in some way. Um, and we see that time and time and time again. And I think these two problems are tied together, right? Because we see characters made Jewish through trauma. It's almost always about Western Europe or American Lower East Side discrimination, and therefore they're also Ashkenazi. So the problems are really close. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I was gonna go through some more of these, uh, but I'll just, I'll just quickly say that the, the Ben Grimm formal retcon was in 2002, and he runs into a shopkeeper uh, from you know, his neighborhood who he thinks is dying on the floor, and he says, he says the Shema over him which is an incredibly Jewish way of retconning him. Then later he has a bar mitzvah and there's like a whole thing. <laughs> it really happens. Um, the area that is doing this well is uh, non-superhero comics, it has had really Jewish content that is not fully about trauma, although I recognize I put Mouse up there, you know, which is a very important com uh, comic. Um, but we have, you know, Will Eisner creating Contract with God, which is a very personal, very Jewish story. Um, there's so much memoir and personal comic. Um, I put Aline Kaminsky Crumb up there and Joe Kubert. Um, and of course, after uh, Bill Gaines had, had left EC Comics, he focused on his humor magazine. Mad, Com Mad Magazine, right, which you're familiar with, which was also, you know, Al Jaffe, who um, just passed away this last year, full of Jewish humor. Uh, this one of, in the very first issue is this comic, this cartoon Ganifs, right? Which is like the, these these Jewish gangsters, these kind of shame shame of the Jewish people, and it's very funny. Um, so there's there's lots of Jewish content uh, that is not about about that trauma, but not so much in superhero comics. 
And what I want to leave you with today, because I know I've thrown a lot at you, is this, uh, the kind of contemporary, what I, why I titled this talk what I did, just coloring Jewish comics. We're seeing a moment that I think is really important in the present. Uh, it's important to recognize it and support it, and the creators who are making it happen, and that we're seeing real Jewish diversity come out in a number of different uh, graphic genres of sequential art, right? What Will Eisner called sequential art when he was arguing for a legit, you know, making this a legitimate form of literature. Um, this, you know, we have uh, so much representation in so many of these comics. Um, this is a, 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 a um, uh, sorry, Converso story about a pirate ship, you know, aimed at young audiences. This is a kind of fantasy comic about a, a written by and about a, a Mexican Jewish um, American. Two Tribes just came out by Emily Bowen Cohen. It's this wonderful story about a Native American uh, Jewish kid kind of coming to terms with themselves. Um, Kierville is about an Orthodox girl who le learns to fight dragons. There's just a tremendous amount of Jewish content, and it's all coming out very much under the radar and not in the field of uh, Jewish superheroes, which is one of the things that, you know, I can't bring the whole exhibit to you today, but it's one of the things that we focused on um, when, I, when I put together the exhibit. I have this whole section with photo booths where people could create their own heroes, and the real challenge is, can you make yourself look like a Jewish superhero without becoming a caricature? You know, what can your clothes and your identity and the way you present say about yourself and how would you introduce yourself in a story and say who you were without boiling yourself down to your trauma or your Hebrew school upbringing or like whatever. Um, <clears throat> so that's really what I, wanted to, uh, what I wanted to leave you with today. And I know I've gone over what I intended to in time, but I could talk about this endlessly. So uh, thank you all for your patience and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Mora, for that really fascinating conversation. And we have time for questions, and I'll just let you go. Sure. Yeah. 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 Are there any questions? Yeah. What can you say about Israeli comics? Oh, so I did put one Israeli comic, or no, several, actually. Um, so there's, uh, do you mean specifically about superheroes or other Israeli comics? There are I some. I didn't hear anything about Israeli comics. I'm interested in Israel, so. Fantastic. Uh, so there are some, especially contemporary, really great Israeli comics. Honestly, all the Israeli comics I read from the 70s are just really, really bad. Um, and this, it's just they were trying to get into the superhero genre. They created Sabra Man, which was just, it's not that, you know, I mean, all whatever politics, it just wasn't a good comic. Uh, so I would not recommend that you read it, although I did put it on display as an artifact in the exhibit. Um, but there are, so Rutu Modan, is an amazing comic artist who's uh, operating out of Israel. Um, she did this comic all the way on the right, Tunnels, um, and she did a comic called The Property, which was really fantastic. It's a, a lot of it is about grappling with, you know, being an Israeli in the world today and her relationship with, you know, her family abroad and her relationship with Palestinian neighbors. And I mean, and it's really fantastic, so I strongly recommend it. Um, in my research on Sephardi comics, I've come across a few artists coming out of Israel that are really excellent. Um, Asaf Hanukkah uh, is living in Tel Aviv, and he publishes a comic called The Realist, which is really amazing. Um, very contemporary, very autobiographical. I think it started as a web comic, um, yeah, and it's and it's really excellent. Um, so I would recommend him too. The, the, the real question, I think, around superheroes in Israel is, and this is a, hard to discuss without just my opinion, but it's about Marvel's Sabra. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of discussion lately about the fact that Sabra is entering the MCU. Has anyone heard this? You read about this? You hear about this? No. <laughs> um, so Sabra was a character that was introduced in the 80s and 70s. Um, and is problematic for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of the contemporary complaints are that the word Sabra itself, yeah. you know, because of Sabra and Shatila, and that it's got its own kind of issues. Um, my problem is that I think it's a terrible character. I just don't think she was ever very well written. I think she was revamped too many times. I think they're probably going to do the wrong one. So that's that's an opinion thing. Um, but apparently she is she is entering the MCU. So that'll be in. 
it, it'll be interesting to see what happens there. Um, but there are actually right now, I know, um, so I was, I also, I, I know that Bob mentioned this during my introduction, um, but I also ran this Jewish comics convention in New York in November. And we were scheduled to have a whole slew of Israeli artists there. And of course it was early November and, and none of them uh, made it but to the, sorry, none of them made it to the convention. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of the creators that I've been working with, including um, Gorf, who's uh, uh, Gorf Finkel, who was in charge of Batman for like, I think he edited the Batman for like 20 years. Uh, he's actually in Israel right now doing a tour of um, cartooning workshops to like help bring up the next generation of Israeli um, cartoonists to write about the, write about, what's happening. Mm -hmm. So Good. there are there are interesting things ah. happening there right now right. in in comics. Yeah. What do you, what do you think about the uh, Israeli actress playing Wonder Woman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so that's that's really an, uh, you know, a question of opinion. I think I, I think I think it was fun. I was amused more than anything when the movie came out, how many people who um, clearly didn't know Israelis were like, wow, she nailed that mysterious accent. <laughs> like, like, no, she definitely sounds Israeli. You know? um, I mean, I think she, I, I, I think that, I think she was very good. I think she was, you know, gorgeous, which I think was one of their priorities for Wonder Woman. Um, I think it's very interesting that she's become this kind of like the female Jewish superhero because Wonder Woman is one of the few that was not created by Jews, although her creation story is fascinating. Um, <laughs> if you ever read about that, the, her creators were into some really interesting stuff. Um, <laughs> look up the whip, you know, it's its, it's, its own thing. Uh, very, very interesting backstory on her, but I think it's funny that she's kind of now been retconned Jewish yeah. just by the casting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have so many questions, but and this is a great talk. Um, I'm really interested if you can tell us a little bit, or if you know anything about um, the reception, the way that audiences responded to these in terms of um, the coding and, and potentially any kind of um, negative or positive responses that were specifically kind of tuned into um, the emergence of superheroes with the sort of implicit Jewishness in there. Uh, or even just because they are collaborative and you see non-Jewish people picking up those stories, was there a struggle for control ever around mm. those aspects of identity um, as you're sort of anticipating audience responses? That's a fascinating question. And what I would have to ask the creators, um, you know, whether there was tension around like the continuity of a character. Mm -hmm. I think, <clears throat> I think there's something very interesting about having characters as long-lasting and um, important mm -hmm. to American culture and world culture as Superman and Batman. You know, you've got these characters that have been written by literally dozens and dozens of people over a hundred years. X-Men, you know. Um, I can tell you just going to the kind of beginning part of your question, you know, the public's reaction to the Jewishness and the Jewish implications of like Superman and Captain America, I mentioned, right, which is that they were protested and threatened and got hate mail. Um, but that was specifically when their characters were attacking Nazism at a time when America was still wounded from World War I and people were, you know, I mean, by comparison, not as wounded as Europe right, from World War I, but people were still suffering um, and coming out of the depression and didn't want to enter the war. So I think that the, the response there was really tied up in that. I think if there was more, um, you know, anti-Semitism as a response that came out of characters being Jewish, it was really tied in with the comics code, which I don't think was in itself explicitly anti-Semitic, but a lot of the kind of themes that are in the that were in the comics that people were complaining about, I think, were themes that were tied to political struggles and socialism, and I mean, a whole slew of things that were, yeah. Um, but for the most part, by the Silver Age, the comics were being written, as I said, very coded. So to you know, people who are familiar with Yiddishisms and with Jewish practice, it's like, oh yeah, these characters are Jewish, sure. Um, or some of, you know, arguably a lot of pro people probably recognized it but didn't think about it at all. Um, like, oh, they're from New York, of course they know Yiddish, <laughs> yeah. right? Right. right? Which is, which could certainly have been the case. Um, LaGuardia spoke Yiddish. Huh? Mayor LaGuardia spoke Yiddish. Yeah, well, his mother was a Sephardi Jew. Oh. 
Most people don't know that. I just learned that recently. Uh, yeah. uh, but I think I, I, I do think that uh, that you know, for the most part, not every one of them, but for the most part, when a new writer picks up the mantle of one of these really classic characters, they go in one of two ways. This is all opinion, by the way. This is just my like my read. They go in one of two ways. They're either just happy to be on the project and they just kind of do what they think other people have done, or they change the character and make it their own in a way that makes it really special. Um, you know, Chris Claremont on X-Men, he, he created Kitty Pride, right? And he's also Jewish, and he brought these Jewish characters in. Um, and, and Magneto, you know, is introduced as Jewish at this time, too, because he brings Kitty Pride to a reception at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. I think I have this on one of the slides. Uh, and they talk, he's recognized by other survivors from the camp who say like, oh, you helped save us, right? Mm -hmm. So there's like, and again, trauma, trauma, right? But a lot of that was put in, but I, I don't think there was a super negative response to it because you're tying it into trauma. Mm -hmm. And they're still white, they're still white presenting, they're still American, they don't seem particularly Jewish. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think it just kind of slid off people. But he, he took the comic and he made it his own. He took Stan Lee's unstatedly Jewish comic, made it statedly Jewish, and then, you know, in this one on the left, this is a more contemporary Kitty Pride, and she's, she's saying in this frame, you know, I am Jewish, I want people to know I'm Jewish, I'm proud of being Jewish. You know, if people are gonna hate me, let them hate me. Which I still put on this panel because more trauma, right? She talks in this frame about her, like, the boy she was in love with in high school turning out to be an anti-Semite, you know. Um, but she was passing, so, you know, so more, I mean, I think different, different writers confronted in different ways. Um, but I can tell you now there is a lot of backlash about everything in the world. So we are seeing more. You know, there's a new daredevil villain introduced last year, and there was a huge outcry that he was anti Semitic because it was an old man, you know, he painted as an old man with a long beard and horns. <coughs> Could also have just been a demon with a beard, you know, hard to say. He did look like an anti Semitic character, but it's not like they said he was Jewish also. So it's, you know, like hard argument to make, but people are reacting that way a lot more now. So I think it's a very different time. Isn't X-Men just inherently trauma? Like the whole, the whole thing is coded Jewish, like anti-Semitism, hating mutants, and all that jazz. So it's not super surprising that the Jewish characters are showing trauma, right? Yeah, I think that's true, but they're showing specifically Jewish trauma. Yeah. I mean, they're also showing, you're absolutely right. X-Men is like every character who's introduced, they're like, hi, here's my trauma, right? Like that's absolutely how it, yeah. Because they're all outcasts and that's how they show up, you know, on the doorstep of the school, right? So absolutely there is that. Um, but these characters have to come in with extra levels of trauma. You know, when they're Jewish, they also have experienced anti-Semitism or they're also the survivors or their parents were survivors or, you know, so there's an added element. But yeah, I think you're right. It's definitely tied in there. I think we have time for one more question. Me? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. That's uh, this is a slightly involved, but I'll keep it as, as simple as I possibly can for you. So in the last, I, I guess, maybe 30, 40 years or something, we've seen a big growth of uh, franchise movies that are connected to superheroes, so the name of Hollywood. Uh, and my question, I'm an old movie fan, particularly like in the 30s and the 40s and so forth. <clears throat> And back in those days, most of the major studio heads were Jewish. Did you come across anything, or do you know anything that says something about the, the glory days of the studio system on Hollywood? Did those men like L.B. Mayer and the Warners and so forth, did they show any interest at that time in developing this as a thematic approach to some movies, or, or is that something that just came later? That's a great question. Thank you. Um, it, it really is, and it's one I'm absolutely going to look into now. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I can tell you the first few adaptations to film were not that popular. Um, I mean, now, obviously, like, they're the most popular films there are, but like the, um, the Captain America movie from the 70s, for example. While Cap, well, Cap was still a huge deal, but has anyone seen the Captain America movie from the 70s? The Red Skull's head is like this big. Off. I mean, <laughs> comically bad, and I don't think it was well received at the time either. I think, I mean, I, and this is probably just, this is definitely just conjecture, but I, I think that the reason that they're so big now is that the technology yeah. makes it possible to make, you know, they're not just like flying around on ropes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. but I, I honestly don't know because, okay. because they did do like, you know, movie versions of, of uh, you know, the other pop, sci-fi, right? Sci-fi was 
was huge. Right. Um, so it's, it would be really, and detective, detective stories went, you know, across medium and um, crime stories. And so it's a great question, but I don't know. I don't know the answer. All right, well, in, let's all thank Professor Moore for his presentation. And in honor of Peter Parker, please, let's stay around at Kibbutz. And uh, have some, uh, we've got plenty of, of food.